Professor Kamina Gunaratna, Dean of the Law Faculty, uh, respected speakers, the staff and students of the KDU, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers of this conference for inviting me uh, for the second time in a row um, for this uh, annual research conference. I'm not sure why I was invited, uh, because I think there are many more important speakers. Perhaps the reason is that uh, they were unable to make it uh, today. Uh, but still, I'm extremely thankful for this very kind and generous invitation. And uh, I thought that I would speak on a topic that has been of some interest to me, even though it's not directly related to the broader theme of this particular session. Uh, there is an old question that is asked um, about international law. That question is, um, is international law law? And why is that question being asked, or why have we asked that question? It's because uh, when we looked around, domestic law and the domestic legal system look very different to international law and the international legal system. And given that we are so accustomed to understanding law uh, in the way that it is defined in the domestic system, and given that we didn't see the main features of the international, or uh, main features of the domestic legal system in the international legal system, we came to the conclusion that, well, international law may not be law after all. Uh, but today, we don't ask that question. Um, or even if we ask that question, uh, the answer is quite clear. There is international law, there is international legal system, or at least a process uh, that we can call an international legal process. Uh, but there is, I think, a far more important, uh, far more fundamental question in town. And that question is whether international law is really international. Uh, and I borrow this particular um, title from a book that appeared last year, published by Oxford University Press. The book is titled, Is International Law International? by Professor Anthea Roberts, who is uh, attached to the Australian National University. And my task is to perhaps introduce some of the main arguments and observations that Professor Roberts makes in this book, in this very exciting uh, book. And importantly, to uh, discuss how these observations raise questions about the study, teaching, and understanding of international law in Sri Lanka for all of us. Uh, and I can only be very brief because I'm given 15 minutes, and I need to summarize uh, a, a book which has been meticulously researched um, today, so I extend an apology, uh, not simply to the author, but also uh, to everyone who's present here. Uh, why does this question arise, international law, is international law international? It arises because there is a general understanding shared uh, within the international legal sort of community, and especially among the international lawyers, that there is this one thing called international law, this one discipline called international law. And that irrespective of the differences, uh, irrespective of which cultural, national, and other uh, geopolitical, regional background that we uh, belong to, or identity that we hold, ultimately all of us come together to talk about one universal uh, one common language, which is international law. Now, that has been the dominant view. But uh, the conclusion that this book reaches, the conclusion uh, Professor Roberts reaches is that this is actually not so. If one carefully examines uh, a number of factors, which I'll discuss in a little while, international law is not really international, uh, or it is not as international as you would like it to be. 
Uh, and Professor Roberts reaches this conclusion by adopting uh, an interesting approach, which is uh, called a comparative international law approach. Now, generally, comparative and international don't go together because uh, we adopt the word comparative to refer to other fields of law, comparative criminal law, comparative constitutional law, and so on. But this is an approach that uh, Anthea Roberts uses. And she discusses uh, this particular question by referring to three main concepts. One is the concept of difference. The other is the concept of dominance. And the third is the concept of disruption. So I'll very briefly explain what these mean and how these raise questions uh, that are relevant to Sri Lanka. The concept of difference uh, basically means, according to Professor Roberts, um, it is that there are many differences that exist in the community of international lawyers. They belong to uh, different cultural, national, uh, geopolitical groupings. They are educated in different uh, institutions, different jurisdictions. They bring together different types of professional experience, some from the foreign ministry, some from academia, some are practitioners of the law. But most interestingly, these national and other differences affect how international lawyers in different states and in these different grouping, groupings engage in the field. In other words, uh, there is, it's not just that there is some difference uh, that is out there that we can see, but that difference and the communities that we belong to shape what we think about international law. Uh, the communities that we belong to and our general uh, identities that we carry shape how we interpret certain principles and rules of international law. They influence how we think about certain issues arising in international law. They influence what we consider to be open questions in international law and what we consider to be closed uh, questions in international law. Uh, so, for example, you might see that, or you would have seen, uh, there were two contrasting approaches adopted by U.S. international lawyers on the one hand and Russian international lawyers on the other about the annexation of Crimea recently. Uh, you find the same approach, different approaches adopted by Chinese international lawyers and others on the South China uh, arbitration issue. Right? Um, so how does this particular issue, this concept of difference, uh, raise issues in Sri Lanka for us? Uh, one is, I mean, the question that arise, one interesting question that arises is how is international law being taught in the different institutions in Sri Lanka? Is it the same international law that is taught in KDU, that is being taught in Colombo, or Peradenia, or uh, Jaffna, for example? What kind of uh, approach do these different academics take based on their uh, cultural, religious, and ethnic uh, identities? How would uh, these ethnic identities in turn affect the approaches that we adopt regarding certain key questions of international law? Right? Uh, if you take the example of humanitarian intervention, how would uh, students and academics at KDU approach that issue? Uh, if you take the issue of self-determination of minorities, how would uh, KDU approach that issue? How would Jaffna, for example, academics in Jaffna, uh, adopt an international law approach regarding that issue? And uh, one can understand what I'm saying if one uh, has an idea about two international scholars that Sri Lanka has produced. 
One is the late Judge C.G.B. Ramantri, who is the former Vice President of the International Court of Justice. And the other is Professor Sona Raja, uh, a very famous scholar, especially in the area of international investment law. Now, these two scholars are widely known in the international legal field, especially to other international lawyers and those who may not know too much about Sri Lanka, as uh, third world friendly, pro-third world international lawyers. And that's true. But if you go through their writings on Sri Lanka, uh, and the approach that they adopt, the way they interpret fundamental principles of international law, there's a remarkable contrast in their approaches. One wouldn't be able to say whether they are Sri Lankans, or whether they're actually uh, two international lawyers and scholars that belong to the broader third world category. It's so contrasting. But why is that? Uh, it may be because, and this is why Professor Roberts's book uh, is interesting, it may be because uh, that they come from different ethnic and national backgrounds. Uh, Judge Viramantri, of course, belonged to the Sinhala community. Uh, Professor Onraja to the Tamil ethnic group. One believes that the uh, Sinhalese did not discriminate against the Tamils. The other believes strongly that they did. Um, so it is their ethnic national backgrounds, the societies they belong to, perhaps, that perhaps shaped uh, what they thought about some of these fundamental uh, questions of international law. So the approach they adopt regarding humanitarian intervention, one is for, the other is against. Uh, regarding self-determination of minorities, one is not so interested, one is extremely interested to the point of uh, being extremely controversial at times. Uh, so these are some of the factors that we don't really think about when we uh, think about international law and international lawyers. The second point that Professor Roberts raises is the po point about dominance. Uh, and the basic argument is, I think, understandable to all of us, which is that uh, even though international law appears to be this thing that is created by the pooling together of different principles and different ideas from various different regions. International law is not so. It's largely, or rather, it is a West that determines what international means in that international law. So, for example, uh, we have certain states, especially in Europe and the Western world, uh, whose approaches to international law are considered to be the mainstream approaches in international law. Right? There are dominant authors of international law, dominant textbooks, which we use as our main texts. Right? Uh, and we never ask the question why we use these texts in the first place. Right? So for example, Malcolm Shaw, Ian Brownlee uh, are being used uh, by many of us. Uh, of course, they should be used. That's not the point. The point is that why do we use them? Uh, it's because they are the most dominant uh, people uh, who have uh, written about international law, but where do they come from? Uh, what about the other textbooks that are around? Uh, maybe in China, because China uses, uh, I mean, academics in China use uh, different books, as Professor Roberts points out. Russian academics use different books, uh, more nationalized, for example. So uh, these are questions that we don't, uh, we don't ask. And there is also a dominance in the sense that you need to, uh, if you want to belong to the international, the club of international lawyers, uh, sometimes you might need to have uh, qualifications, postgraduate qualifications from certain institutions in the European world. Uh, and that's how this club is sort of, uh, the membership of this club is determined. Uh, so simply put, West is an exporter of international law, whereas most of us uh, are importers. We receive what is being 
discussed, what is being taught uh, of, uh, in that particular world, as if it was international. Uh, now, how, do this, how does this raise questions for uh, those of us in Sri Lanka? Well, um, one way in which it would raise a question, or one of the reasons why we should raise a question is that we would know uh, why we are teaching some of the things that they are teaching uh, in international law classes. Uh, so, for example, next time we pick up Shaw, the next time we pick up Brownlee and the other writers, we would know that this is not for no reason. There's a uh, reason behind um, why we have to pick up these books uh, if you have to teach uh, international law. Um, what about alternative, uh, alternative approaches to international law? Uh, apart from the Western approach to international law. Right? Um, are we using them or are we discussing them in class? That's one question that I, as a teacher, would, uh, would raise. Uh, is it the same old thing that you get in Shaw that you teach the students, or do we teach an alternate way of thinking? If there is an alternative method that we use, do we see dominance even within that alternative system? So for example, there are scholars who talk about third world approaches to international law. Uh, but do you, for example, see some form of dominance even within this particular school? Uh, certain people who might be considered to be more authentic uh, in the expressions of third world concerns, uh, and so on. Um, and then, uh, what of international law, or what would be international, uh, what would international law be like if we taught international law in Singhala or Tamil? Uh, I, for one, I mean, I'm very much a proponent of English education, uh, so I'm not promoting the teaching of uh, international law in Singhala or Tamil, uh, because it is, it has to be taught in English. But the very statement that I made, which is that it has to be taught in English, shows that there is a particular language that is dominant uh, in international law. Uh, and in international law, the la most dominant languages are uh, English and French. Uh, so these are some of the issues that arise uh, for us uh, who are teaching international law here. And then finally, the issue of disruption. Professor Roberts argues that the way we approach international law and the way we understand international law is going to be disrupted uh, with certain changes that take place. One is technological advancement. Uh, through better technology, we'll get to know what other countries have written about international law through translations and greater dissemination of knowledge. Uh, and we'll come to know that there are far more uh, approaches to international law than we thought there were. The approach to international law would also change with the changing political dynamics uh, of states. We see this happening in, in, uh, in regard to uh, Trump's election. Um, and these shifts in, in, in politics would change how states come to think about international law. And then, more globally, there's a power shift from a unipolar world to a multipolar world, uh, which means that it's not the West that is uh, continue to be dominant, but it's other uh, countries which are now gaining greater power um, in world politics. And over time, we would, be, we would not be reading perhaps Shaw, but maybe some Chinese scholar or Russian scholar, right? So the point here is not that we should get rid of the Western influence. I'm certainly not uh, arguing uh, that that should be the case as someone who was partly educated uh, in some of those institutions. But, uh, and also, uh, quite, quite honestly, uh, the non-Western approaches to international law might be a bit more worse than some of the Western approaches. You never know. Uh, as those of us who are exposed to certain regional influencers in politics. In particular, we know that, well, there are problems uh, with many large states 
surrounding us. Um, so uh, it's not a case of dismissing Western influence, but it's about asking um, what kind of approaches would we adopt if in the future countries like China, India, and so on are to determine what international law is. Uh, in conclusion, the point is that this question that I raised, is international law really international, uh, is important not only because it raises important questions of international law, but also because it raises very interesting questions about our own selves, about our teaching uh, of international law and our studying of international law. Uh, it's a question which helps us to challenge the romantic assumptions that exist about this international character of international law. Right? Uh, and the task, as I said, is not to dismiss international law or to dismiss Western influences of international law, because that practically cannot be done. So it's foolish to try it. Uh, but rather, the task is to be more sensitive to the different changes, uh, to the differences that exist in the international legal community. It's to realize that international law can be both universal and particular at the same time, as Professor Marty Koskinen would put it. Uh, and also to realize that we too are biased. We sometimes critique West as uh, maybe a biased region, part of the world. Uh, we critique Western international lawyers for being biased. Well, we too are biased. And uh, that would be seen uh, perhaps in the future when other countries come to dominate the international legal scene. Finally, if international law is not really international, what happens to the teaching and studying of international law? I think nothing is going to happen. I think what will happen is that international law teaching and, and studying will be far more interesting and exciting precisely because international law is not international after all. Thank you very much.